some conversations kept kept on going yesterday. Oh. for the conversation after the presentations. I'm very much looking forward to, to, to listen to the participants that are presenting this morning. And Barbara Materia is going to be the moderator and introduce them all. So welcome again, and thank you for joining. Yeah, maybe. And perhaps also understanding better uh, the difference, if there is a difference or not, probably is between uh, audience, public, and consensus. Um, and also maybe understanding what Esther was mentioning yesterday night, yesterday evening of this activity for professional to engage with non-professional, so I hope we'll hear more about this. And without further say, I'll start introducing our guest speaker. Um, Chantal Blakely uh, is an architect and architectural historian with strong interest in architecture and philosophy. Her scholarship focuses on forms and monumentality and configuration that have motivated architects since antiquity, bringing to the light aesthetic values that might be traces of of transient cultural moments or architects responsive to imperative from outside the discipline. Blakely is currently working on the publication Appartamento Aperto, at home with Marco Zanuso, uh, published by MIT Press, uh, as well as teaching at Rice University. Uh, Esther, uh, Esther Choi is an artist and historian whose work investigates how concepts of nature have shaped and been shaped by the aesthetic and narrative conversation of Western world making practices, as well as the potential for dialogical and televisual aesthetics to generate experimental structures of social engagement. Choi is currently getting, uh, is a Getty ACL as a postdoctoral fellow in the history of the arts and working on a book tentatively titled The Organization of Life. And from UAC, uh, we'll have Thomas Kelly. Uh, he's associate professor here at the School of Architecture at UAC. Um, where, he's teaching, uh, where he's teaching focuses on the role of representation in architecture um, as technological, cultural, and historical instrument and explores new possibility for all buildings in contemporary practice. He also co-founder uh, of the Architecture and Design Collaborative, Norman Kelly. And uh, finally, Stuart Hicks uh, is also founding par partner of Design Week Company and also associate professor here at our school. Um, and also Associate Dean of the College of Architecture, Design and the Arts. Um, his, design focuses, his design works focuses on how literature and architecture intersect through fiction, character, type, or metaphor, and how these themes can translate into installations, speculative urban scenarios, temporary pavilions, and design for buildings. So please, I'll hand the word, I guess, to Chantley first. Chantal, sorry. I'm plugged in, but is it? Oh, it's weird.
probably need is it, well I just have to send it to somebody. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you, Barbara, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Florencia, for the invitation. And thank you to all of our uh, guests for making it to Chicago. <coughs> My brief presentation today is called A Particular Architecture. Uh, 40 years ago, Kenneth Frampton's essay, Towards a Critical Regionalism, Six Points for an Architecture of Resistance, sandwiched an argument between the flattening of our post-industrial globalized civilization with postmodernist tendencies to assign value to building through reductive vernacular tropes. What resulted was an essay that inspired architects to consider how context might be reconsidered so that we might reconsider, as Frampton puts it when he quotes Paul Ricoeur, how to become modern and to return to sources. As a response to today's discussion on contemporary, or the contemporary, I believe that Ricoeur's anxiety about progress without hindsight as well as Frampton's disciplinary myopia, are as relevant today as they were 40 years ago. Recently, my partner Carrie and I have been meditating on a response through a studio we are currently teaching at Yale School of Architecture. And like most academic opportunities, it is uh, guided by a selfish desire to understand the kind of work we do in our practice and how that work relates to the current time and specificities of place. For the past 10 years, we have practiced a form of architecture and design that focuses its, at its attention on you, the viewer, oops, uh, in the hopes that you might appreciate what was already there in front of you. To do this, we often look back to proceed forward. And so much of our work succeeds something found. And by found, we are exacting. Like the Smithsons, the as found is something physical, something historical, might be an extant building, a brick, or a piece of furniture. The completeness of the found object, however, is subject to close examination. We breathe our sights, we review original drawings, we speak with the community to assess why a change is required. Like a physician, our aim is always to do no harm, but sometimes we find it's better to do nothing at all. To succeed, something found demands that we resist newness for something more particular, perhaps a form of historical maintenance. The particular is both process and property. It not always resonates as idiosyncratic, but instead oscillates between forms of contextual legibility that share equal favor with the obvious, like a table whose form has been sheared to signal an exit in a house museum as well as the esoteric, like a remontage of Stanley Tigerman's 1978 Titanic postcard foregrounded by a complacent looking architect in which his building sinks into Lake Michigan. Whatever it is we are looking to uncover is typically hiding in plain sight. After all, you need to see it too. I suppose this way of looking or attention seeking is a form of uh, dumb optics, a reflexive form of looking that places value on the viewer's recognition of their present self. Think of it like the death of the grand tour or an expanded balance between modernist tendencies to abstract tradition with vernacular tendencies to reflect it. Not saying that architects should replace a trip to Rome with a scavenger hunt through their own backyard, 
but we have found that meaning or that the meaning we seek in our work is tethered to recontextualizing something immediate and tangible. The challenge with this kind of practice is finding ways of performing it in a way that feels as refreshing as this is the discovery of one's own reflection for the first time. And how we foreground some latent potential within an existing context tends to lean a bit counterintuitive. For example, here a retail shop's egress plan is rearranged to obscure the view of a tree to accommodate a stair to a basement. The result is not profound, but practical. The view, once shared by all, is now reserved for employees only. We found that the indirect sunlight produced even helps the product labels read more clearly. Like a tailor, we make alterations to something that already exists in the world. And while the economics of reuse are not always practical, we strive to do more with less to keep costs down and impact high. Here, for an exhibition on the work of the artist-architect Shusaku Arakawa and the poet-philosopher Madeleine Ginz, we recover a prohibited drawing. Complications in the curation process emerged because of legal disputes between two foundations, each of which claimed ownership of the duo's body of work. And in the late stages of the curation process, many drawings initially selected for exhibition were prohibited due to the ongoing legal battles of ownership, including this sketch on the left from one of Arakawa and Gin's most significant projects, The Mechanism of Meaning. To recover the drawing, we reconstruct it. The result is a drawing approximating Arakawa's original sketch, as well as two containers for the display of framed works, archival ephemera, and a bench that sometimes displays a person. When we begin to take stock of the ways in which we are conditioned to comprehend people, places, and things, the particular serves to provoke a fundamental question. What is context? Well, context is everything. Context is anything. Context includes and context excludes. What is context but a bunch of stuff that one filters in or filters out based on their own predilections? Our desire to engage context head on is not meant to replace authorship with refinement or provoke, promote a rear guard aesthetic movement, as Frampton may have implied, but rather to an incite an egalitarian way of interpreting, interpreting the world around us. The result is not a question of how regional or how global something might appear, but a question of how to make something public, or at least visually accessible to a public, and to do so in a manner that completes something found without being too specious or too populist. Sometimes our interventions blend in with the material or construction fabric of a larger project, as in the case of the most recent American Pavilion at the Venice Biennial. Or sometimes our work questions and advances social narratives that once attended the object's original form. For example, the original 18th century tilt-top tea table, more than the teapot or the teacup that rested on its surface, was the object by which the ritual of tea drinking gained its recognition and acceptance. Brash honesty or gossip that characterized tea table discussions constituted a sort of circumspection that effectively policed the actions of the powerful and elite by threatening to expose scandal and subject any wrongdoers to ridicule. Our table extends the watchful eye of the tilt-top tea table by lengthening the pedestal and fixing the tabletop vertically. The piano-finished walnut is also highly reflective and now functions as a standalone mirror. To polite society, being particular is how one might refer to someone with obsessive compulsive disorder. To someone like Bertrand Russell, however, distinguishing the particular from its universal counterpart is more convoluted, requiring one to determine how percepts yield concepts and vice versa. For us, this has meant sidestepping our own predilections about the scenographic, as well as Frampton's demand for tactility in lieu of other forms of perception, like sound. Here, a renovation to an office lobby originally designed by John Burgey with Philip Johnson included the refresh of several amenity features and security items. Uh, like a cafe was refaced, electronic turnstiles were installed, even an enunciator panel was repositioned to make more code compliant. And while we would have liked to introduce more features, the existing sculpture in the lobby's northern apse by the artist Anthony Caro, titled Chicago Fugue, turned out to be far more expensive to move than it would be to contextualize. Together with iArt, a media architect who's previously worked with Herzog and Demeron in the M Plus Museum and Kristen Gantenbein on their Zurich Kunsthaus, we designed an immersive audio experience set discreetly behind the perforated brass risers of an amphitheater. 
Once the amphitheater senses a user's presence through its 81 light sensors and th three motion sensors, a musical score comprised of 15 instruments, four tempos, and seven keys and scales play. The software is driven by parameters that include time of day and weather. And so our instrument is literal and reflects the figurative instrument by Anthony Caro on the opposite side of the lobby. Let's have a quick listen. We understand that defining particular is a nebulous practice, but consider the particulars being situated somewhere between the essential, a must-have, and the accidental, a happens-to-have but could lack. In a building project, the essential might be the reduction of form to local construction standards and egress requirements, or primitive containers towards maximizing FAR. In the same project, the accidental might be a singular and fleeting observation about a reused material or a prosaic social encounter between users with a Harold Bloom-like swerve. In the case of a sneaker shop we designed several years ago, the particular yielded in an instance to resolve an essential and provoke the accidental. The original building once functioned as a factory, and the entry served as a loading dock with, three foot, with a three-foot grade change. And when we first encountered the space, then serving as an art gallery, no remedies were taken to accommodate handicap accessibility. And so we convinced the owner to give up a third of his square footage to making a generous ramp, or rather four ramps that weave around the existing structure to transition the public from sidewalk to interior. To our surprise, the success of this form transcends its accessibility value and promotes a form of retail public space that practices unselling. Today, the ramp space is open to use for anything but sneakers. Originally, our intention was to give accessibility legible form. OMA had done it some years back with their IIT student center nearby. But to our surprise, many ways in which the owners actually use the ramps include workshops, speaking events, toy and book drives, coffee shop pop-ups, and art installations. There's instances like these where we are encouraged at the particular, an architecture that encourages approximation, regionalism, and site sensitivity, can provide change that transcends any of our original uh, intentions. Thanks. Sorry about the technical issue before. So thank you, Barbara, for the really wonderful introduction. And, and thank you, Lorencia, for the invitation. It's really wonderful to be here uh, with you all and uh, to speak today. Um, I, I, I'm currently operating as an architectural historian, primarily, and, uh, but I was driven to architectural history after a few years 
of practice sort of craving more models of how an architect can operate than I was seeing in uh, the professional realm. And um, my dissertation, as was mentioned, dealt with uh, Italy after World War II, but what I'm going to talk about today um, is an American architect, uh, an African-American architect who practiced in St. Louis, because I think, um, well, this is a project I am also working on. Uh, it's been supported by the Graham Foundation and um, the Getty uh, Research Institute. Um, it's a project that it strikes me as an important one, but it's a, a body of architecture that d is not sort of set up for sort of historical examination in the conventional way. It's an architect who didn't write theory, whose work was never published, and so forth. Um, but I, I found in the prompt for today uh, what might be a, a way in to this architect to, to starting to bring this kind of subjectivity of this architect into view and, and by, that, by doing that to make his work accessible in a way that allows us to appreciate it. So I'm going to talk about contemporaneity in the work of Charles Fleming, the architect, um, but I'm finding that in a way his way of being contemporary, contemporary was also bound up with a way of engaging with history, both the history of architecture and the history of St. Louis where he lived. So Fleming was born in St. Louis. His parents, uh, his mother had been born in St. Louis, but his father had <coughs> migrated from Mississippi. This is 1937 when he was born. His maternal grandparents had also migrated from Mississippi, so they were part of the great migration in which African Americans moved from the south uh, toward industrial cities uh, farther north, and there was a sort of pipeline up the Mississippi River. And one of the salient sort of character traits that Charles Fleming acquired from his formation is a kind of reticence. Uh, he's, he's a man of few words, and he has explained to me that his father was also a man of few words, that his father growing up in rural Mississippi had been counseled not to talk because uh, sort of speech by, Af by black men in the presence of white people could so often and so quickly lead to uh, sort of violence um, that his father internalized this to so such an extent that he essentially had a no-talk policy, counseled the young Charles, who was growing up in a very different situation, also not to talk. So I mention this because um, there's a way in which this, these people internalize their situation and um, they lived in an enclave of mostly other migrants that was essentially self-sufficient. Uh, there were builders. Um, of course, uh, the building tradition had long been the business of, of blacks in the South, in America, uh, but not at a professional level, in a more informal level, and also uh, as slaves constructing houses and so forth. So, um, but it was cut off from the rest of St. Louis mostly with sort of a few points of contact. A particular place where Charles Fleming grew up was next to a brickyard where the newly arrived migrants could find uh, labor. Um, but next to this neighborhood was another neighborhood. So now in, we're in 19, I'm sort of flashing forward to 1950s St. Louis where with the aid of the GI Bill and other uh, sort of economic stimuluses, young families are purchasing houses, and there was uh, by this time the sort of emerging black middle class uh, as well that began to build houses in nearby neighborhood on Bennett Avenue, um, but at the same time a highway was extended west from St. Louis, went right through this neighborhood, and there was a need to move houses. Fleming's grandfather was a builder and a wallpaper hanger, by a trade and was very involved in moving the houses, and so the young Fleming was moving houses as well, caught the uh, attention of uh, local building superintendents and, and practicing architects who we began to assist. So his first house was this house shown on the right, a uh, kind of um, suburban ranch house in this neighborhood uh, where the houses were sort of moving around. 
In this context, Fleming, who had gained skills from his grandfather, um, became aware of the, the profession of architect. Uh, so even in his yearbook in 1955, he was listed as sort of intending to become an architect. And what, he, what happened was he ended up at night school at Washington University, uh, where he earned a building certificate in 1960. His instructors were recent graduates of, of Washington University. On the left, I'm showing a picture of a building for Southwestern Bell by Edward J. Thias, who was one of these uh, recent graduates who was teaching in the night school of uh, Fleming's instructor. And Thias had been a student at WashU when the Swiss architect Alfred Roth was uh, teaching there as a visiting professor. And he had internalized, and I know this because I've looked at Thias' papers in Missouri, uh, State Historical Society of Missouri, uh, where he actually has sort of put a page of Roth's essay on the practice of architecture and the education of architects, which essentially says, uh, don't try to be flamboyant, just meet the needs in the most pragmatic way possible. So this is the sort of ethos that Charles Fleming uh, absorbed from his teachers um, in Wash U. These are some of his student drawings for Thais, where he's you know, laying out these sort of quasi-symmetrical, sort of Miesian type single story uh, buildings for a medical building or a library. So um, there's a sense in which Fleming, uh, you know, is practicing this architecture that's essentially contemporary. It's, uh, I would say, rooted in the recent history of the modern movement. Um, but I find Agamben's uh, commentary on his definition of contemporariness quite evocative with respect to the condition of sort of African American St. Louis circa 1955. Um, this idea that contemporariness could be a relationship with, that adheres to its time through disjunction and anachronism, it seems to me that there is a sort of inherent disjunctiveness and inherent anachronism in the conditions in which uh, African Americans were living in, at the time. For example, there were no, um, like businesses like, uh, services like uh, funeral homes, um, doctor's offices uh, tended to be in the community, in people's homes, banks, um, salons to operate out of the homes and not to have sort of purpose built buildings. So again, these neighborhoods were like enclaves that only sort of dealt uh, among themselves, well, for the most part, uh, until people earned enough money that they would begin to try to move out. Um, so there's a kind of sense in which these, they're, they're living in, with a sense of once they get out and they see this sort of like, you know, 1950s prosperous consumer society. Uh, this, this need to catch up or this desire to have, you know, to, to exist in a sense, uh, the way others do around them. Fleming's very first uh, sort of architecture project for which he was credited was a medical clinic for a Dr. T.E. Rusan, who, uh, you know, it was on a sort of main street, it was a freestanding purpose-built building, and it was such a sensation that it had, was celebrated with an opening event and published in the newspaper and so forth. And on the right is just another of Fleming's early clinics, this one, the Horde Clinic in Kinlock from the early 60s. Uh, other buildings uh, by Fleming, uh, I'm looking at the period, let's say 1956 to like the late 60s, included this, the Wade Funeral Home on the right. So it's the space suddenly of this, this modern uh, pavilion with a circular drive where people can go through the ritual of the funeral with a certain elegance and formality. Um, that it was not it was something quite different from uh, the typical condition where actually the uh, undertaker operated out of his own home. And on the left is uh, the Gateway Bank, which I will talk more about uh, in a moment. Um, Fleming also did churches, new church buildings, and also applying this sort of style. So, um, I was also taken, while I was poking around, I had never re read Agamben before, and it, I thought of Nietzsche's untimely meditations, um, and I was particularly struck by Nietzsche's idea of the historical men. They look to the past, and they, um, they find motive to look toward the future, uh, and they hope that what they want to happen will happen. They, they believe in the process of history, so they, they, they think that they understand from looking back like that there is a process and that by participating in this process they can help to bring into being the future that they want to see. Now Nietzsche was kind of um, 
uh, I believe, taking aim at a sort of idealist picture like the Hegelian model of history in which there is a subject with a certain life and um, this process is sort of, could even be scientifically studied. Uh, and the way I read Nietzsche in his kind of pushing back against this like overstating this idea of the process is that he's saying you, you really cannot expect to be an agent of history that you're sort of writing in, the, in a deliberate purposeful way what what eventually then happens um, problematically but um, but that still what um, our acts still contribute to history so he thinks the idea of the historical man the historical imagination of seeing the past imagining a process expecting the future has value, but not for a science of history, rather for the creation of life, for life, for the drawing benefits for the immediate uh, present, in a sense. This is at least how I'm reading Nietzsche. And it's this, this also uh, strikes me as a way of understanding Fleming, because he was very proud of being an architect, his professional qualification gave him entree into participation in his community in new ways. Um, but he also, in it for, to make a project like the Parks Chapel Church, uh, which I show on the left here, uh, 1969, it looks like a modern building, but to make this, he, he was only able to work with African American tradesmen because the white tradesmen would not work for a black architect. So this meant that he didn't use a lot of glass, for example. He used like landscapers um, and brick masons because that was the, those were the professions that uh, local black tradesmen were in. And in some, he often had to train them and teach them and work with them to make the buildings. Um, so he's got to work with what he had to construct this image of the contemporary, in a sense, for the community. Now, in looking at uh, Fleming's work, it's, it's uh, in the context of the wider uh, mid-century modern St. Louis architecture, it's, if we compare him to an architect like Frederick Dunn, whose uh, Faith Salem Church I'm showing on the uh, left here in a photo from the Missouri Historical Society, uh, and on the right, uh, Charles Fleming's Mount Esther Baptist Church of 1965, we, we just, it's, I, my, even my first impulse is to say, okay, this is sort of a less, like, less significant work, um, that less maybe fully real, I mean, I, all of the kind of, like, catchphrases of judgment um, that came to mind seemed somehow inadequate to me because I also understand that these kinds of projects were significant in their way. But what's also interesting is how Fleming, um, borrowed forms and tropes from other architecture, from this wider pool. And it's in that way that he was able to make these buildings that uh, provided institutions for his community uh, that brought a sense of parity to them, to that community, to make it visible. Uh, one could say that made it part of a, of a bigger public um, uh, by sort of appropriating details. And in this way, his work is significant I, I think um, because of how it converged with the sort of history of African Americans in St. Louis. Um, and the Gateway Bank is a particularly um, sort of prominent example of this. There was an issue in which African Americans were not um, served at banks um, without hostility. They were not made to feel welcome in the spaces of banks. Banks would not hire black cashiers. Uh, banks often would not locate near black neighborhoods. And so there were protests. Um, and in protesting against the situation, also against housing discrimination, blacks were joined by Jewish groups and other um, sort of progressive uh, white St. Louisans. So it was a sort of historic moment for St. Louis, the bank protests um, that involved sit-ins in, in the local banks. Um, and during this time, this early 60s, a group of black businessmen uh, got together and established the first uh, black-owned bank. And Fleming was the architect for this. Um, it, it was built in an old union hall, which he renovated. Um, he added these like vertical elements um, that you know, give it a kind of a sense of being update, up to date with the current banks. He also, for this, had to travel to Kansas City to see other black-owned banks so he could understand the bank equipment and how to make it work. 
they constructed a sign for the bank, which um, echoed the then just being completed St. Louis Arch, the gateway, uh, and that became part of their kind of iconography. Eventually, the bank uh, became very well established, and but the point is that to have this condition for African Americans in St. Louis, it, it, it had to be constructed in a place like this. And so this banal like counter for tellers or this sort of waiting area, which seems so um, mundane, was actually in this moment of achievement. Um, and even the, the bank was robbed in 1968, sort of like further proof that it had arrived. You know, it's, it's sort of like, it is just a bank now. Um, and so that's this kind of historicity, uh, one aspect in Fleming's practice that uh, I hope to bring out more as I continue to work on a monograph on this architect. This is a picture of his, uh, his own office, which he uh, built in a renovated building downtown. And uh, just here he is in around 1974, uh, having become an architect. Um, thank you. Um, that was super interesting. Thanks, Chantel. Um, I don't know if this is on. No? Is that on? No. I think we're on. We're definitely on now. Um, thanks, Chantel. I was just saying that that was super interesting. And um, I think as also, uh, I took a similar approach in terms of thinking about um, the prompt of this kind of like theoretical model of the contemporary actor, but placing it in relief in relation to a you know a particular context, um, but um, first I would want to also thank Florencia and uh, for the invitation. Um, the conversation here has been super interesting, and um, like I was saying earlier, like kind of kept me up at, at night. Actually, I was kind of thinking about yesterday. Um, and Barbara, thank you for the for the introduction. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Um, so, um, so as I said, I, I took a similar approach, but my historical actor actually has like in some ways like nothing to do with architecture. <laughs> There's no architecture in this uh, presentation. Um, so in some ways, I want to dedicate this talk to, um, th there was a question yesterday about you know, looking at historical actors or practitioners from other fields um, that we might be able to learn from. And I don't know if that person's here. I think their name was Alex, maybe? Is that right, Alex? So anyways, Alex, I dedicate this talk to you wherever you are in this building. <laughs> okay, so I've, I've tentatively, I'm, I'm, this is like a, a sort of a new body of, um, like I, I took this, uh, this event as an opportunity to try to unravel um, my interest in a particular historical figure who I said has like no literal connection to architecture but I think um, has provoked for me a, a really rich way of thinking about um, the role of contemporary criticism in, th in theory in, in a way um, and also ways in which theory um, and even cultural practice generally can perform as a kind of like co-created experience and, and that's something maybe I think we can talk about later. Um, uh, okay, so to begin. In his book, The Shape of Time, from 1962, the art historian George Kubler suggests that synchronous registers of temporality can be located at every historical juncture. Using a spatial model that summons an image of a bubble's membrane mediating between interior and exterior atmospheres, Kubler argues that specific historical periods can only be seen from a vantage through a larger topological vantage. Oh, sorry, historical periods can only be seen from a distance through a larger topical, uh, topological vantage. He writes, by the same token, we cannot clearly describe the contours of the great currents of our own time. We're too much inside the streams of the contemporary happening to chart their flow and volume. We're confronted with inner and outer historical surfaces. 
of these, only the outer surfaces of the completed past are accessible to historical knowledge, end quote. So Kubler expounds on his idea of simultaneity using con comparisons of objects to suggest that these contours form a kind of parallax such that objects made at the same time cannot constitute a suitable basis for a comparison if each was produced within a different context. So using the example of Visigothic reliefs and Mayan sculptures, Kubler argues that although they're made in the same year, they cannot constitute a suitable basis for a comparison since each one was produced within different contexts. For Kubler, the Mayan sculpture pertains to an old, what he calls an old series, whereas the Visigothic work marks the moment of a serial emergence. So in a similar way, I believe the same can be said of even historical actors uh, who have embodied strategies and modalities that may perhaps resonate beyond the, their historical registers and speak to present day concerns. So in the next 15 minutes or so that I have, um, I, I, would, I would ask that we rewind to the early 1970s. The biophysicist and environmental scientist Danella Meadows, which we see here, was a 29-year-old researcher at MIT when she co-authored an infamous report titled Limits to Growth with Dennis Meadows, Jorgen Randers, and William Behrens III. Produced from 1970 to 1972 with a team of 16 researchers in the System Dynamics Group at the Sloan School of Management, the published report became notorious worldwide for its forecast of the limits of the Western world's commitment to exponential growth, intuiting within the contours of their historical moment what we might now call the great acceleration in the history of globalization. Limits to Growth, which went uh, on to sell over 9 million copies, was commissioned by Aurelio Pace, an Italian industrialist who was best known for reviving Fiat, the Italian automotive company after World War II, and Olivetti, the Italian manufacturer of computers and electric, uh, electronic business products in the late 60s. Uh, Pache was also a proponent of implementing multinational industrial schemes throughout Latin America and majority world nations. In, in 1968, two years prior to the report, Pache assembled a group of 30 businessmen, economists, civil, civil servants, and scientists, primarily based in Europe, who refer to themselves as the Club of Rome. Like the aims of European humanistic endeavors in modern science and technology that had preceded them, particularly in the interwar period, the group sought to respond to what they perceived to be the decline of the human race by projecting their primarily Eurocentric and Anglo-American perspectives into long-term policy initiatives on a global scale. Now, the Club of Rome convened in 1968 to address an especially daunting problem, which they dubbed, quote, the project on the predicament of mankind. This ambitious undertaking encompassed vast issues, such as, just, such as poverty, environmental degradation, urban sprawl, inflation, and social decline, which they viewed to be interconnected matters of technical, social, and political significance worldwide. At a conference held at MIT in the first phase of their project, Jay Forrester, a professor at MIT and the founder of System Dynamics, showcased his World Dynamics model, which used computer simulation to sketch the complex and nonlinear interrelations between the world's populations, ecologies, and economies. So based on Forrester's work, Danella Meadows and her MIT colleagues engaged in a systems-based world-building project using the World 3 computer modeling software to analyze the potential consequences for the West's unquestioned commitment to growth, modernization, and so-called progress. That limits to growth was commissioned by an automotive industrialist and so-called uh, and backed by the Volkswagen Foundation with vested interest in fossil economies notwithstanding. Many of the circumstances and questions that Meadows and her colleagues tackled in this report are conundrums that still plague us as contemporary cultural practitioners in the midst of the same environmental crisis today. Questions such as, if these global trends are not brought under control, what will the consequences be? What methods does humankind have for solving global problems, and what will be the results and the costs of employing them? Using what they referred to as, quote, five trends of global concern, that is explosive population growth, environmental decline, malnutrition, the exhaustion of non-renewable resources, and growth in industrial production, 
the authors inputted multiple scenarios into World 3. And, well, spoiler alert, the outlook on the Earth's future was appallingly grim. With each outputted scenario, the authors concluded that with existing policies intact, the physical planetary limits to growth would be exceeded within one generation. By the mid-21st century, familiar living standards would be completely eroded. Indeed, each of their apocalyptic projections suggested that the unrelenting consumption trends of Western life could and would cause planetary damage beyond repair. Though Meadows has always addressed the insufficiency of the data set as a definitive basis for universal projections, um, it, indeed it would be impossible to model a totally accurate singular set of results given the immense scale of the enterprise, although recent studies have actually demonstrated the accuracy of their projections, the authors of the report concluded that if growth proceeded unchanged, the best case scenario would entail, in their words, a rather sudden and uncontrollable systems decline in both population and industrial capacity. Yet the report was not entirely a death sentence either. A second outcome, they reasoned, was actually possible. Growth trends could be changed within roughly 50 to 100 years or more to achieve ecological and economic stability, meet the basic material needs of all human beings on the planet, and afford each human being fair and equal opportunities to realize their potential as a human right. This goal, however, was a moving target. The authors added, quote, if the world's people decide to strive for the second outcome rather than the first, the sooner they begin working to attain it, the greater will be their chances of success, end quote. Now, Meadows may seem a, a strange outlier in a conversation about problems of the contemporary, especially when convened within an architecture school, but we might consider how Meadows regarded systems as synonymous with world-making endeavors underwritten by particular values and cultural commitments. Gregory Bateson, an influential figure in her own thinking on this topic, argued that complex systems such as the processes of civilization, human behavior, human organization, or biological systems, and even cultural practices and institutions, I might add, are designed as self-correcting systems that are always, quote, conservative of something. In such systems, changes occur to conserve the truth of some descriptive statement, some component of the status quo, end quote. So embodying the disjunctive position of the contemporary figure, Meadows perhaps exceeded her own professional training uh, by going on to focus on how systems and the values that underwrite them could be changed towards sustainable ends. Now I've gone through the trouble of recounting the findings of this 1972 doomsday report, um, and as well as Meadows' subsequent critical engagements with these findings, to deploy a rear view approach to history, trying to refract the ghosts of the past to project historical parallels into the present. And in my view, this historical episode points to two profound dilemmas posed by conceptualizing contemporaneity and forms of contemporary cultural practice like architecture when we are running out of time. That is, when we are in the midst of the sixth extinction. First, we can't discuss the concept of or act along with contemporaneity without discussing how climate emergency, and in particular how the anthropocentric discourse within the environmental sciences and humanities of the past 20 or so years has changed our understanding of time and of the scale of change. And second, when placed in relation to the context of the existential threat posed by climate emergency, Agamben's contemporary figure is thus confronted with the ethical imperative to respond to this dilemma. Now on the first point, Agamben's emphasis on the contemporary impulse to respond to one's own temporal disjunction by dividing and interpolating time, in his words, transforming it and putting it in relation with other times, carries further stakes when placed within the registers of environmental history. Evoking Kubler's kind of synchronous theory of synchronous registers, Deepesh Chakrabarty has suggested the need to distinguish planetary history, or the geological, from human history and the global. The contemporary practitioner operates within heterotemporalities, what Chakrabarty describes as, quote, the conjuncture of three and now variously interdependent histories whose events are defined by very different timescales. That is the history of the planet, the history of life on the planet, and the history of the globe made by the logics of empires, capital, and technology, end quote. 
Chakrabarty describes how the fundamental representational codes involved in analyzing the globe and globalization are different from those involved in articulating the magnitude of global warming, which operates at a planetary scale, that is, the planet in relation to other planets, and at the scale of multicellular life. So this challenge uh, thus poses for the contemporary cultural practitioner um, so, so the challenge this poses for the contemporary cultural practitioner is how global warming takes us away from an earth and human bound imagination. Yet uh, Chakrabarty reminds us that for all their differences, thinking globally and thinking in a planetary mode are not either or questions for humans. Lodged within such synchronous registers of temporality, and given that our own current circumstances are the result of human actions, um, the million dollar question is how are contemporary practitioners to respond to a set of circumstances that seem entirely out of grasp and yet conditions in which they participate in while not falling prey to rehearsing the universalizing and colonial tendencies of past schemes. Now although Meadows would likely loathe to be called a contemporary cultural critic, her seminal text Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in a System, written nearly 30 years after the report, offers, in my view, a striking example of how one can intervene in one's own disciplinary framework by retooling disciplinary conventions, in her case systems theory, for the analytics of power, paradigms, and worldviews, and in turn generate an apparatus that can be deployed by other users to hack a given system, such as a disciplinary system, and beyond. Now the argument in leverage points is as follows. Leverage points are like acupressure points or places in a complex system such as a corporation, a city, an ecosystem, or an economic system, even a planetary system that can produce big changes. And ideally for Meadows, these changes would be towards more sustainable ends. In attending to the world's most pressing problems, Meadows notes that experts tend to fixate on specific areas for the answers, and more often than not, find themselves pushing in the wrong direction, because they have no idea how these complex systems actually behave. So the key is to closely observe the systems, identify their leverage points, which is a really tricky proposition, as a location can sometimes be counterintuitive. So as part of her 12-point theory of places to intervene in a system, Meadows identifies that one of the most effective places to intervene is, quote, the shared idea in the minds of society, that big, great, unstated, the big, great, uh, unstated assumptions, unstated because ne unnecessary to state, everybody already knows them, that constitute that society's paradigms or deepest set of beliefs about how the world works, end quote. She argues that to enact system change, we need to focus on shifting the middle's shared idea about an issue rather than focusing on extremes. Paradigms are the sources of systems, she writes. From them, from shared social agreements about the nature of reality, come system goals and information flows, feedbacks, stocks, flows, and everything else about systems. So how do you change paradigms? In a nutshell, you keep pointing at the anomalies and failures in the old paradigm, you keep speaking louder with assurance from the new one, you insert people with the new paradigm in places of public visibility and power. You do not waste time with reactionaries, rather you work with active change agents and with a vast middle ground of people who are open-minded. So Meadows' engagements with systems analysis and disciplinary critique are useful, I think, to cultural producers insofar as they act as a model for the outcomes of critical engagements, which in some ways will always require a kind of relational outlook and the participation of others. Like the outputs of systems analysis, contemporary theory criticism, even historical inquiry, are not to be taken as predictions or solution sets that fall prey to the colonial, patriarchal, and otherwise dictatorial enterprise of offering a singular dogmatic rubric from which to reimagine the world. Instead, in a conference on sustainable systems, Meadows refer to the outputs of a system, systems analysis as, quote, mental exercises to try to understand why a system is doing what it's doing, and more importantly, how to make it change to work in such a way that we, as elements in the system, automatically and to our own short-term rational benefit, do things that make the whole system work, instead of do things that make the whole system not work. So the projective dimension in this particular stance 
uh, in my view, is no less political in its refusal to offer an easily consumable instruction set. Rather, its acknowledgement of the need for multiple perspectives, interpretations, and avenues of action that are import importantly motivated by a central set of values grounded in liberation and, and healing, proffers a methodology that recognizes and values the inherent differences between actors unveiling and questioning the moral codes and symbology that underwrite and perpetuate a given system's relational structures and processes, such as the commitment to a paradigm of unquestioned growth, what Bateson referred to as the system's impulse to conserve some component of the status quo, is the challenge, in my view, that contemporary cont cultural production asks us to undertake today. So in closing, to return to the question of the contemporary, what exactly is at stake in revisiting this question today? For the world-building enterprise of architecture, the contemporary is inescapable from one's ethical imperative, a commitment to identify a profession and discipline's caustic belief structures, uh, such as our unrelenting commitment to growth and modernization, and rewrite new outcomes. For if the contemporary is an attempt to decipher what's happening within the inner contours of a moment, when one finds oneself too much inside the streams of contemporary happening to chart their flow and volume, as Kubler wrote, in an era of climate emergency, the dilemma posed by the contemporary and the ability to respond to, is, to its exigencies is further exacerbated by not knowing how much time is left at all. Thank you. This thing is, oh, is this thing on? Yeah. I'm gonna start you, all right. Thank you all so much for the honor of being here. This is really exciting to be able to, oh boy. No. There we go, all right. I can talk closer. Um, I'm really excited to be able to participate in this conversation. Um, you know, here, we didn't know going in what everyone was gonna talk about and I keep seeing, you know, hearing and seeing all these connections and I'm really excited to get to it. Um, so yeah, uh, based on Ignacio's talk yesterday, I actually decided to, or that, that talked a little bit about the space of the studio, I decided to sh start with this clip here uh, uh, from a video that I made about a year and a half or two years ago. Let's see if it works. Maybe. person once told me that all good architecture leaks. While I'm not entirely sure what they meant, leaks must, at the very least, be an important part of architecture. I help manage facilities for an architecture school, and there are a lot of leaks, like this one, or this one. This one hit me on the head. This one sometimes leaks on my students' models. The last of my students who had their model christened by this perennial leak has graduated and now is studying for his master's degree at Princeton University. There must be something to this whole leak thing. But I didn't really learn that much about leaks when I was in school. To catch up, I've done some research and I've collected some of my personal experiences and I put together this guide to architecture leaks. These are my five points of leaky architecture. Did you know that there are four kinds of leaks? Yeah, I didn't either. I'm not even to my five points yet. We're still in the intro. Anyway, there's liquid flow. That's when water just kind of rolls into the building. Then there's capillary reaction. Apparently materials just want to bring water into buildings so badly that they suck it in like a vacuum. 
Air movement is number three. When air gets into buildings, it brings in a certain amount of water that is dissolved in it, and we need air to breathe. We can't just steal off the building. Then there's vapor diffusion, where rogue molecules just pass through materials even though there's no holes, like magic. It seems like leaks... Oh, man. Leaks aren't hard to come by. I want to thank Grant Gibson for supplying the footage at the very uh, beginning of that. That's, uh, he has to take care of that leak himself. But uh, I've been making videos like this on YouTube for about the past two years and four months uh, now. Uh, and this one was actually seen by facilities management here at UIC. And I am happy to report that a few of those leaks were uh, patched up. I don't want to take full credit. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think it really showcases the power of YouTube. Uh, so nowadays, then, there's been about 100 of these videos over the past couple years, and they've been viewed uh, about 30 million times uh, for a total of 2.3 million hours of consumption. Uh, and I'd like to report some findings and share some thoughts around that, so buckle up. We're going to get in on audiences and get really uh, muddy doing it. Oh, boy. Okay. Currently, the most popular channel on YouTube that focuses on the built environment is Architectural Digest. It has over 6 million subscribers and has over 1 billion views in total. Their most popular series is called Open Door, where celebrities take you into their homes. Hello, Dee. It's me, Rita. Welcome to my home. Thank you for coming all the way to England, London. Come on in. to tell you the history of this house. One of the main reasons why I bought this house was because of the history. So it was built in the 1800s, originally owned by an illustrator called Arthur Rackham, one of my favorite artists. He did all the illustration for Alice in Wonderland, Red Riding Hood. The house has a lot of energy, good energy, all the creative sort of juices that I need and that I kind of felt as soon as I walked in here. All this original sort of like glasswork that you can see up here was here. I'll, I'll stop it. I'll spare you the, the rest of it. <laughs> Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown used to play a game that they called I can like something that's worse than you can like. And I guess what I want to do is rehearse that with you now. How can we study the medium of YouTube, which privileges stuff like this? and use it to engage audiences around architectural concepts? And what can we take from this study to, uh, of this YouTube medium to be able to understand audiences in general? YouTube is not contemporary. At this point, it's one of the oldest, still relevant, large-scale hosting platforms on the internet. While it isn't contemporary, it does know what is. My channel features videos that range in topics from leaks to indoor uh, urbanism, to Michael Maltzen's 6th Street, 6th Avenue Bridge in LA, to the changing designs of McDonald's franchise restaurants. All along, I've been attempting to frame how the world works through the lens of architecture, often with Chicago as a protagonist. Not only is YouTube not contemporary, but these videos are typically the sorts that they call evergreen, uh, topics that maintain relevancy over longer time spans, which, I mean, YouTube's only been around since 2006, so I don't know what that means, but rather than contemporary events. Uh, but these videos are specifically targeted for YouTube as a specific medium. And when you post to YouTube, it's not just uploading a video for others to happen upon. It's much more than that. And the nuances of how all that works revolves around particular assumptions around the concepts of time, the importance of the present, the future, etc. And I thought that simply describing how the video production and the reception works, or showing under the hood a little bit, might be an interesting way of thinking about timing and maybe even the contemporary. 500 hours of content is uploaded every minute to the platform of YouTube. No one can watch it all, and the problem of sorting it and deciding what should be shown and to whom and when has led YouTube to develop algorithms and interfaces for doing that job effectively and efficiently. The process will dictate whether a video is seen by 100 people or 100,000 or a million or more. Maybe what is contemporary is obsession with views and subscribers. But interestingly, YouTube does not show you a video because you are a subscriber. It also doesn't show you a video because you searched for it. The platform's homepage presents to you what it thinks you will like at any given moment and uses what they call the algorithm to figure that out, which is part of what distinguishes YouTube as a specific medium, distinct from other forms of video consumption. This yields a medium that privileges a, a certain kind of space, a certain kind of presentation of space, and a certain way of understanding space. The space that YouTube likes has a story, People seem to want to hear about why Rita chose her historical home. 
Space is filled with people doing things, people building things, people explaining things. These people have the power to change and they affect their environment. And I think this is, at least what I read into it, pretty identical to what Andrew Holder was talking about the other day, uh, where there's this air of that you can do it too, whether or not that's actually true. The audience of this YouTube space are people that are curious about that other space uh, that's being shown to them. And they're both in that space and outside of it and interested to know more. And each of these statements, I think, has ramifications, which we'll discuss. But I want to set some terms first. A view. A view on YouTube is counted after 30 seconds of someone watching a video. And that's no, that doesn't matter how long the video is. So while Rita's tour has over 300 or 3 million views, less than about half of those are around, are around at the halfway mark of the video's total length. Uh, there's a measured factor called retention rate, which we'll talk about in a minute. And YouTube wants the number of views of a video that it gets to equate with certain metrics uh, that have a particular bias. They attempt to genuinely ascertain the kind of experience that people are having while watching a video. And they call this metric satisfaction. That's the official term that YouTube uses about how good a video is. And while no one has a perfect understanding of what satisfaction is, because a lot of it is driven by AI, we can observe what factors seem to play into it. And I thought this, that's how I thought this connected to Esther's talk just a second ago. YouTube supplies all the data around how your content is performing, including demographics, what else the viewers have watched, what they search for, how they got there, the retention rate, and much, much more. A sliver, a small sliver of that list is uh, shown here. So content creators have access to most of the data that YouTube collects and use this data to craft content that is more and more tailored to it. But not all that data is available because the YouTube also runs these surveys on their videos, which you might have had before, that ask you literally how satisfied were you in watching this video, and you don't get access to that, unfortunately. So the satisfyingness <laughs> of a video is the metric of how spreadable that video is. But how many people are choosing to engage that video is also important. Unlike platforms like TikTok, uh, long-form content on YouTube has to be actively clicked and engaged. The measurement of the rate of how many click on a video is called CTR, or the click-through rate. That's the rate at which people click on a video after an impression, what they call an impression. And an impression is when at least 50% of the video's thumbnail, not the thumbnail and title, is shown for more than one second on someone's screen. Longer videos tend, that have maybe a lower CTR, but they could still get views because they, uh, people on, YouTube wants to keep people on their platform longer. Shorter videos might have a higher CTR because they seem like less of an investment for the viewer. Mine average between, uh, my CTR averages between 2.5 and 8. You can see the graph here, um, depending on the video. So in baseball, you only have to hit the ball about a third of the time to be successful. And on YouTube, you only have to be successful about 8% of the time. Uh, and the graph at the bottom shows the overall CTR for the channel, as well as um, uh, every video being published uh, every two weeks on Thursdays at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. CTR is de determined largely by the title and the thumbnail of the video, not its content. Those two things work in concert. So some of the most important parts of engaging an audience really have nothing to do with the video itself at all. And this graphical preview is also hard to curate. Titles and thumbnail images are shown differently depending on someone's device or where they see it. Some contexts, like on mobile, cut off the title at about 55 characters, and others show it as part. Or others are able to show part of the description of the video before you click on it. Many YouTubers will use a resource to be able to display all of these different graphic possibilities, so that you can visualize how your video will pre-appear uh, for the audience. And this is just an example of mine, which we'll come back to in a minute. Titles and thumbnails also have to stand out relative to others around them. According to most sources, effective thumbnails usually tell a story, evoke an emotional response, and include three elements to achieve that. In this example, we have the smiling face, which welcomes you to click on the video. Faces humanize the content and trigger our mirror neurons. So YouTuber face is this strange phenomenon that you might have encountered of these overly exaggerated expressions to make the content itself feel more exciting. But here we have the text uh, here we also have the smiling face of Rita, as well as the text, and the, uh, the environment behind her. 
Open Door is uh, a, the, the most popular series on Ar Architectural Digest. Uh, so we're seeing the title of that, so you might have recognition of that you've seen one in the past. And then we're seeing also, the, as the third thing, the space that we're about to uh, engage. And so if you happen to remember when I was showing that video before, this is almost exactly the frame that you're going to see when the video starts. So the audi audience knows exactly what they're going to get into when they click on this video. But for me, it's not always easy to do that. Uh, so all these things become a giant puzzle to every single video. The topic that ex and the, what examples are going to be used, the introduction, the title, the thumbnail, are all balancing each other out. And this is an example of what happens when things go a bit awry, <laughs> because all the puzzle pieces were constantly in motion. This is a re retention graph at the bottom middle for a, a single video, and it shows what percentage of people are watching at any given point in the video, when they leave, where they skip to, uh, and so on. And this is a particularly bad one, just to make a point. Um, also, just to note that it starts above 100%, uh, so don't get fooled. Uh, it starts above 100% because videos start playing automatically on your home screen sometimes. So at the time that I wrote this video, I didn't know if the video was going to be pitched as a general concept of restorative landscapes or just about Chicago's examples. So hedging the bet, I made a general intro that was about general things, but all of the examples were in Chicago. And obviously on YouTube and other endeavors, introductions are an important part of the hook. Usually 20% of the audience stops watching after 30 seconds. Um, and as an aside, just for this audience, I've gotten a lot of comments on these videos saying that they're too academic in their intro and that um, they need, I just need to get right to it, so I'm still learning that skill. But I liked this thumbnail, which was Chicago-focused, but didn't know which title I was going to go with. The thumbnail showed the idea clearly and quickly, and it seemed to pique curiosity. And the misaligned intro resulted in people skipping away or clicking away because it didn't exactly match with the title and the thumbnail. And on YouTube, you can change the title and thumbnail anytime. So you can change the packaging of the video anytime, but you cannot change the video at all after you upload it. So it becomes bal about balancing these things and compromises along the way. So titles and thumbnails are extremely important. I agonize over them until I can't anymore because there's no time left. But also change them after a video is published if it seems like it's underperforming. This is a typical workspace of testing out titles and thumbnails. Uh, combinations, you know, and to see what they would look like in, in context. Uh, as you could see in this one, I came up with over 100 title options for this video, which, looking at it this way, is a bit obsessive. Um, <laughs> this is my first time uh, presenting this in an academic environment, so the, the mirror is, is burning me a little bit. Um, titles and thumbnails usually start as part of the pre-production process, which is the first week of executing a video. Uh, that, that first week also includes researching, writing a script, collecting assets like imagery, stock footage, 3D models to make an animation, uh, and making those animations and things like that. So here's some, just some close-ups of ideas for that video along the way. I'm not a graphic designer, not a marketing expert, but I have to put that hat on every two weeks or all the time, really. It's really important you know, how you begin the story uh, and how that relates to each and every intro and video. And what you think is the intriguing story at the outset doesn't necessarily end up being what the video is really about, according to other folks. As an aside, arrows and before and after comparisons are highly effective tropes for piquing curiosity. So you can use that, uh, that little tidbit uh, in your own work. Um, <laughs> I had a video with the original title that this is what happens when architects design a bridge. It was about Michael Malton's Sixth Street Viaduct in LA. The initial angle was, hey look, you know, this piece of massive infrastructure was designed by an architect. A thing that usually isn't designed by an architect, you know, isn't that cool. Um, no, one, no one cared at all, like it was, it was floundering. Uh, what people do care about is how the design is going to affect them, you know, maybe the way that this large-scale thing is going to impact its surroundings. And then when I changed the title, the title alone, the video all of a sudden appealed to a much, much, much larger audience. So how you build the story for architecture and where you start that story is probably the most important choice. People don't care what, uh, that we're able to find architecture anywhere. anywhere. What they think, uh, you know, what's cool, it, it, I think it's cool that an architect designed a bridge, but the, the average person doesn't. And what they care about is what architecture does and if there's a good story behind it. 
There's also a lot of uh, thought that goes into this stupid thumbnail. Uh, so putting the price seems kind of crass, but that's maybe a stand-in for the scale of this thing. The, the word icon, uh, you know, went over that for weeks. Uh, you know, I think is important because maybe it's a useless thing if it's an icon, or maybe it's extraordinary because it's an icon. And then the title is sort of presenting a future. You're not getting a history lesson here. Uh, we're presentizing the content, which is very important. Um, and never put the title of the architect or, or the, the project in the title of the video unless, you know, it's Frank Lloyd Wright or something. So the latest video about Marina City is why everyone wants to live in these corn cobs, uh, which is admittedly hyperbole, but it works. I write out everything. Every script is about 2,300 to 2,500 words, which makes for an 11-minute video. A video, if a video isn't that long, it's because something didn't work out. Uh, it's a different kind of writing. I try to write as I speak, which, uh, you know, I study YouTubers. One of my favorite is Tom Scott, who, who argues that his, his superpower is the fact that he's able to write as he, as he speaks, and he's able to present very fluidly and naturally because of that. So I always use a teleprompter, and I film everything twice, once on, once on site and once at home, so I can switch between voiceover and, and uh, being on site whenever. And then when I conduct interviews or tours, if they're present, I kind of sprinkle them through a pre-written uh, pre script. Everything gets edited in Adobe Premiere. Uh, there's a fun timing equation here, too. It takes about an hour of editing per minute of video. Uh, this is a rough, what a rough cut looks like. It will get many more layers uh, as color grading gets added, sounds, music, labels, things like that. Time is on the x-axis, and layers of imagery and sounds are on the y-axis. And this is all part of post-production, which is the second uh, week of a video's life. The channel attracts viewers that don't watch Architectural Digest. But that doesn't mean I'm not trying to learn from Architectural Digest. Instead, viewers of the channel watch a lot of science stuff, like Veritasium. They watch a lot of law stuff, like Legal Eagle. They watch a lot of politics, geography, and stuff like that. Typical viewers are before, between 25 and 34 years of age, and a little over a half are in the United States. And I didn't know it at the time, but that was probably the people I was talking to at, at the outset, trying to. I've been teaching YARC here uh, and for a number of years, which is the program where um, students who have a bachelor's degree but not in architecture are expressing some interest in architecture maybe want to get into it. And so those are the folks that I think I'm trying to present to when I'm talking to the camera by myself. So it's a broad audience with varying backgrounds that are related to architecture, but they're all curious. So I'm not arguing that the discipline be more like YouTube, or that anyone should be creating anything that is tailored to these principles. I'm also not arguing that getting more views is what matters at all. But YouTube is a medium that presents space in a very particular way. It's also a conduit for reaching audiences in ways that you wouldn't otherwise. YouTube isn't entirely non-architectural. It is a space to explore. Maybe the way viewers are matched to videos can allow us to think about audiences in a contemporary way. A lot of people are introduced to architecture through places like YouTube's. YouTube. My therapist says YouTube's. Um, so I, I've ingrained it. I'm sorry. YouTube. Um, and as we all know, introduction matters. Uh, we should grab the chance and shape its reception and not leave it to architectural digest. We've talked about audience and the potential of its dismissal and that we can't possibly engage because we can't control another's interpretation or reception. But crafting a broadly appealing introduction to architecture that navigates the icky world of views and likes doesn't have to discredit or dismiss our expertise. High and low can coexist, but maybe need different terms, because it's not really a ladder that connects them. What we define as high and low can easily coexist and maintain rel relevancy. A, a YouTube video can talk about high architecture and read a, uh, reach a broad audience without dilution, without bringing it down per se. Uh, but it's where you start that's important. And that's why if you're making videos for YouTube about architecture, you might consider studying Architectural Digest, as bad as that sounds. Thanks. Thank you all for the wonderful, wonderful presentations. I think there is a lot of inspiration, um, a lot of maybe common denominator. Uh, not not easy to kind of like find a common line, but I think there is uh, something that um, uh, somehow returning all the four discussions that you made, and I think it's 
kind of like the necessity that you all feel to uh, try to like recontextualize or contextualize and also uh, the need to having a direct confrontation with the past, not necessarily with a past past, but also like with a close past, in trying to re-understand our role as architects, not only as professionals or historians or as a you know, multidisciplinary environment, like um, Esther was mentioning. So I was wondering whether, I think something else that came out from all your presentation is uh, the ability of like trying to understand the system we are operating in and doing that, like operate from within in trying to understand how to create a new audience, so not to comply to what the audience want, want, wants to have, like with its work, I think was, yeah, I think the example of like trying to come out with the with the right title for for a video doesn't really compromise the way you want to communicate what is your idea of architecture and how do you think architecture should be uh, uh, should be more accessible for everybody. So maybe it's a problem of language or it's a problem of like medium or uh, different tools that we are using as professionals or historian. Um, so I was wondering, maybe the question, I don't know if it's really a question, <laughs> probably more for, so far it's more an observation, but I was wondering how relevant it's for you to uh, have this direct confrontation with the past in order to understand better uh, the contemporary, if the contemporary exists, uh, or how as architect uh, we can project into a future uh, by understanding uh, and having a more closer confrontation with the, with, the, with the past and understanding the context we are operating in. And, and maybe also how relevant is for you to like the medium that you're using to try to open up the architectural discourse for a larger audience uh, that is not necessarily addressed to professionals but also like non-professionals and how um, this approach influence also your way of teaching. questions. Um, I guess one place to begin would be that, um, and maybe this is like, I don't know if everyone feels is like a fair common thread, but in my notes I was like thinking about, um, like Chantelle in your, in your talk about Charles Fleming, that in a way like the bank or whatever, whatever building um, is an apparatus for a kind of soci socio-political project, right, around liberation. And but it requires public use and participation to be activated, right? Like, you know, we, t we tend to talk about static container um, in which things happen, but actually, no, it's like a catalyst for other things to happen, right? Like a certain set of effects. And in the same way, like Thomas, like the way that you, um, and that really beautiful example of like the kind of sonic orchestration, right? Of like all of these different kinds of atmospheres that. You know, it, it's a co just like YouTube. It's a co like you need you need eyeballs. <laughs> you need an audience, right? And also, I think um, there is a being fin. I don't know. Oh, maybe if I do that, it's better. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's this idea of in some ways like publics in some ways that we might uh, enact kind of by default imagine, but also counter publics that are created, you know? Um, so I guess it's like, I don't know, it's not really an answer, but it's just like an observation maybe of like, um, I don't know what you'd call that, like, I don't know if it's like a strategy or a sensibility or something that kind of seems to tie um, a lot of our interests together, but, um, but also that these things are not like, um, you know, like the term, um, kind of binaries came up yesterday, right? These like dichotomies that actually like I found like Thomas in your presentation the way that you drew a continuum, um, a kind of like gradient um, in which something could fall, right? And then you have like a, a kind of target in a way of like what you would imagine to be that kind of balance of whatever it might be. You know, it's like this is a very abstract the way I'm talking about this, but I think thinking through gradients or intensities or like some kind of dynamic variables or whatever, like seems to also be something that um, 
yeah, I don't know, I just see in common. Um, Stewart's uh, presentation was this that moment when you know you were getting no like no satisfaction, <laughs> <laughs> and then you made a change like to the title, and then suddenly it's like so it you discovered what people really wanted, what was really driving people to watch all the way through, and that's something I wish I could do. Um, it's something I think about in teaching, actually. Um, you know, if I could discover that way of finding out, like, what, what would make my students, you know, feel that I was speaking to them. Um, because I feel like, you know, we're at this moment where the world in which I was educated in the humanities still really, um, the, the sort of culture of the mid 20th century um, has given way to a whole other sort of framework of attention and interests including some very positive ones, like students wanting to see like, you know, people like themselves in whatever way that might be represented in the material that we're presenting. Um, it's, it's a huge challenge to try to re-gear oneself from that like, academic framework into, in, in order just to be able to, to communicate. So I think there's, like, it, it's really, like, I, I think I can learn a lot from looking at, you know, your, your videos and the audience because in some sense, your audience overlaps with, or at least the kind of target that you speak to overlaps with the people who I'm trying to speak to, like from my like, academic position. So um, yesterday, I think something that came up was this idea of, of, of monoculture and agreements and monoculture and then like what might be imagined as like non-monoculture agreement. Like what, what would that be? What could that be? But I think this kind of hybridity, like we have on this panel, where you have architects, you have like YouTube uh, producers and like historians, this is kind of like a plural, um, non-monocultural conversation, which I think is it's a really important conversation to be able to have. Maybe you want to maybe return to this uh, kind of issue of um, gradients and uh, maybe structuring um, uh, work uh, in between poles as opposed to um, uh, kind of an over deterministic way of um, designing and kind of uh, understanding how one's work might be appreciated. I think you know Carrie and I uh, uh, in invest a lot in in the kind of conv I know, conviction of our design behind like a hard line drawing. Like, we're kind of committed to that uh, form of, um, kind of communication. And, and, and with that, I think, comes a certain amount of uh, uh, expertise, um, uh, and then also a certain amount of presumption that like what you're drawing um, is, is, is going to be kind of executed um, to, to an exactness, to so a certain kind of degree of exactness. And, and, and what we found and what we're most excited about is uh, when we kind of build uh, or kind of design uh, in, in ways that maybe um, appreciate that kind of that level of exactness is going to uh, fail uh, at some point whether it's with like sourcing materials that are imprecise and trying to kind of uh, lay them out in, in, in precise manners that uh, we tend to kind of loosen up and uh, take note of um, maybe other factors that are kind of guiding the, the ways in which we can you know uh, uh, deem work satisfactory or not and and uh, I think what we are uh, experiencing now is maybe a, a trend towards maybe other forms of um, kind of assessing like the, the value of that work, and it's it's largely not through drawing or not through kind of the conventional means that we've kind of otherwise been trained to do so, and and also like the different audiences, right? Like we were trained to design for other architects to look at our work <laughs> and to be critiqued by them, um, and we're realizing that that's no longer maybe of interest to us. I mean, I think a certain degree of expertise is important within our field, but, but being able to kind of shift the conversation toward kind of identifying maybe new constituencies for um, uh, understanding that work um, is, is really valuable to us. And I think this is also where I think um, um, kind of designing kind of within 
uh, or designing a certain amount of looseness within kind of these maybe overstructured frameworks that we're uh, we've been taught to, to produce is, is exciting. Uh, this is also why I think like we're trying to recuperate things which we were kind of told were kind of out of fashion, like uh, indexicality um, and things that I think, uh, when done the right way, can actually um, uh, make make work very accessible uh, to a public. Um, and also at kind of different different speeds. I mean, we're constantly just you know uh, mirroring or reflecting kind of our surroundings with the work we do, um, and it's uh, open to the public to determine like what value that has on kind of interpreting the work. Hello. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, the way I. I keep coming back to the historical man comment. Like I was talking, we were talking. Barbara and I were talking in the break room before this about the changing nature of precedence and the way that it's used. And it was brought up yesterday uh, that it seems like every studio has to begin with precedence nowadays. And it was kind of that I've been thinking about that in relationship to Charles Fleming. And uh, it feels like what you're offering is a gift of. Charles Fleming's experience for folks to kind of own and to take forward as historical people, you know, historical, like, I guess that's the way I, I see a lot of this playing out, or like, the value of this is that the history is for you to take versus like the precedent as some sort of distant thing that is perfect unto itself that you have to learn about to call yourself an architect versus you owning it and uh, participating in it in some way. Um, I don't know, I guess I just, I guess that's the way I, I when you said, when you mentioned that you, you wish you had that kind of magic tool of a, of a title or something that could make things resonate, I guess I, I mean, you are, like it feels like you are, like that's what you're doing, like you are, that, that is exactly what you're doing by um, finding this kind of avenue for folks to uh, embrace and own this, this, historical, this, this person and their journey and I appreciate that a lot. Thank you for the presentations, and I, I really enjoyed like getting another angle. I would say that when planning the panels, I kind of didn't put a title, but I thought that the first one was more about pedagogies, the second one about more design in particular, and this one in a way about ideas and criticism and everything. And I think there was a common thread, even uh, thinking about Thomas's presentations. Uh, more regarding to the practice, but I think in the way that you understood the, the critical regionalism idea by, by Frampton and in the rest, there was always this idea of leaks and capillarity that I really appreciated in your first um, video, the first one that you show. Uh, and, I, and I think that that happened in different ways, maybe in the two first presentations, um, the idea of the context in both cases, even though about talking about very different situations, but the context and and as as Thur mentioned, the um, kind of uh, the, the apparatus, the, the building as something that represents other things and that puts together and things that come to the building and that go out in a way. The context in, in a reciprocity, I would say, with the people, with the area, with different other things that you described as the accidental and the, um, the, the in-between between the essential and the accidental, right, in, in a way. And I think that was really interesting. And maybe in, in the presentations, uh, in the two last presentations, the ideas of how to intervene in a system, but at the same time of kind of the message, the message and how do you kind of talk about things. And I was thinking then about this in relationship to the situations that we discussed yesterday about the studios. And maybe when we put all together on the table and we are talking and trying to define things in, in between and, and with all the diverse amount of topics and issues that make architecture and the built environment and the world in, in, in a way, um, I think maybe there's something in this idea of the performativity and the cultural impact, both in the words, both in the and, and in the buildings. But I I was kind of thinking about what you said, Paul, about the intentionality and meaning. So trying to put together these leaks 
and to change the conversation to through maybe in the studio when we are talking about something this idea of the performativity of everything of the cultural impact if we kind of keep on um, impacting through leaks into the conversation I think that is what changes meaning or, or what gives meaning to education in a way so I wanted to put that on the table and maybe um, ask what do you think about leaks or <laughs> I mean, leaks are bad, right? No one likes leaks. They, uh, they, ru they ruin things. I, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, in, the, in the interest of maybe being uh, disagreeable, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know, like, I find a lot of themes somewhat depressing with the ease that uh, people are willing to embrace the notion of audience without being reflective as to what audience really is that like Francesco pointed out, it's market-based, that architecture uh, existed uh, you know, for as long as communities have, which is to say uh, before the notion of a consumer existed or consumption. Um, and, and it's a really strange thing. And I think it makes us a bit confused. It makes us make statements like Thomas does where there's a confusion of interior retail space as public space. Um, and I, I don't know, like, I don't know why that doesn't trouble more people to kind of confuse popularity for meaningfulness, uh, to defer to metrics of cost or viewers, even with the caveat that you're not particularly claiming that that's a measure of importance, but it still seems an aspiration uh, in a way. And, and it seems, I don't know, to me, it seems a bit, a bit troublesome to ease that these things are just absorbed. Um. Um, yeah, maybe, oh, sorry. Uh, maybe audience is not the right uh, word, but I think uh, there is a problem in seeing uh, all the constituencies that intersect with the built environment as passively accepting things. like. Uh, and I think, like, of decades of post-colonial theory, we've learned, like, what we understand as subaltern populations, like, being active in the co-creation of things that were, like, uh, or in the appropriation of things that were meant uh, as impositions on them, like, uh, Indians transforming cricket into something else, uh, but even, like, uh, diasporic, diasporic populations appropriating American pop to do something of their own. Uh, and I think, uh, like in seeing those crowds sitting in Thomas's uh, stairs, or like in uh, when you were presenting the leaks, uh, I was thinking on Guadalupe, the cleaner. I don't know if you ha guys have seen the beautiful film by Ila Becca and Louis Lemon, like uh, managing the leaks uh, of uh, Kuhas's house, or in the bank uh, robbery as a kind of uh, putting that bank and like uh, the kind of new ways of financing like for black folks in San Luis, like uh, starting to see these objects operating in the world in ways that exceed the uh, uh, intentionality of architects, but uh, giving them meaning uh, um, by different constituencies, there is value. So, and in those audiences are not passive, they are not just uh, kind of uh, the result of kind of market dynamics. And I'm not trying to say the YouTube algorithm is not awful. Uh, like it makes us all like uh, spend more time than we should watching things that probably we shouldn't. Uh, but uh, I think there's also a problem in assuming that people that listen to popular uh, music is just passively accepting the messages that come with those uh, and the saying that uh, our role when putting these uh, objects in the world is uh, to kind of uh, assume all those constituencies that intersect with them to be passive in its reception. So I, I think there is value in thinking about this leaks uh, uh, 
in which objects, uh, through which objects operate in relation to those constituencies. Uh, yeah, but I, I, okay, so with the, the comments on, it's not about, I'm not denigrating listeners of popular music for their tastes in audio choices, right? I think my criticism is about the notion of an architect trying to produce a project for maximum like audience capture or something, which is to say what you are willing to uh, accept is all the corruption in the systems that produce the world so that you can ignore those problems so you can produce something to get people eyeballs in what, whatever way possible. And that seems, uh, I don't know, kind of sad, sad to me in a way, right? Like I think there's, there's a lot of strangeness in, especially in a forum like this, in a public university, in an, you know, in an academic institution to privilege the market over something else, right? Instead of to resist it or to find fault with it um, and to just say, well, that's the world and we're trying to get our ideas out there so we'll accept it. Because doing that means an implicit exception or acceptance of all of those faults in a way. Um, so people can listen to whatever they want. I mean, lots of weirdos listen to main skin and stuff, but like that's terrible music, right? So, uh, but from them as the kind of production artist, not as the listener's fault. But doesn't that put you in a pretty precarious position? Like, you just got a lot, you just spent a lot of years working on an exhibition, you know, like exhibiting. And I guess as, you know, someone taking this stance while exhibiting and being an exhibitionist, I guess it seems really duplicitous to take that stance. It's the, I mean, it's, it's literally out of the market, outside of the market. Like it wasn't selling anything. Like it was an exploration of a topic. Like doing an exhibition isn't the same thing as uh, trying to produce something <laughs> for the most affection. So there's no money exchange with the you know? That's not the. I mean, that's not the same thing as selling. A, a consumer product. Can I say something very, very I think it's a very privileged position in claiming that we operate within, without, like, outside of the market. Uh, yes, maybe we can do it within the school, uh, like pedagogically, trying to teach students that they have to believe in the value and try to fight with the value and try to design something that reflects their value without comply with the market rules. But I think it's really privilege, it's really a privilege saying I don't have to comply, I don't have to work with the market. But because I, I'm not saying you, you don't have to comply with it. I'm saying that there should be some thoughtfulness and not just accepting the the kind of worst characteristics of it. Absolutely, and I totally I agree. But I think you know like you need to understand how the system works in order to retail space. Like that's not like, that's a weird transformation that it I think is. effortlessly occurred. It is, but isn't uh, it like a strong gesture? I somehow uh, appreciate the gesture of like inserting and kind of like saying to the retailer, look, I'm taking 50% of, of your uh, surface that you can just like fully cover with merchandise and just like spoil the system and just like maximize the profit out of it and just saying from an architect point of view, like, look, I don't care about your profit. I care about design, I care about like communicating something, so half of your store will just be dedicated to nothing. There will be no, no vitrines in there, no merchandise. Right. I think, I believe this is a but positive way of reaction the to the market. Because it wastes retail space for a project, and I think that like, is, a, is a particular intention. Like my, my criticism was not about the, the, the architecture or the store, the kind of uh, irresponsibility of, of Thomas to throw away a good portion of square footage yeah. for not moving merchandise. Uh, it was just the kind of thing that I noticed or heard immediately, which was the ease of saying public space about something that's not public in, in any way. Right? Yeah. I find it a useful uh, thought experiment to ask. Um, what does uh, Stewart's click-through rate have in common uh, with Paul's well-made door? And it 
seems to be that there um, are an awful lot of similarities in terms of how value is measured and the kind of model for the conference of value. So the, the model goes something like once upon a time, there was an individual who had an encounter with architecture or a video. And if we could simply arrest that encounter sort of mid happening and crack open that person's mind, we would get a yes or a no, and we would understand the value of the thing that we had put out there in the world. Um, and I would just say, if you inquire deeply into the social sciences, like no serious uh, designer of surveys would ever tell you that's actually a kind of possible phenomenon. Like Pierre, Pierre Bourdieu actually writes uh, an essay called Public Opinion Does Not Exist. It's the asking of the question, is this valuable or not, that actually precipitates the answer, which is just to say it was kind of a constructed fiction from the get-go. Um, maybe what is more interesting to me as a way of assessing the, the worth or lack thereof of what we do is to examine architecture's alignments or uh, maybe misalignments with the kind of meta narratives that govern what we think reality is. So I found it very interesting that Esther sort of lifted up this, this example of uh, the meta narrative as a kind of leverage point. What is it that people believe? What's the kind of shared mythos? Um, I found that that had actually quite a lot in common with um, Chantel's identification of an architect uh, who in a certain sense is coming from an identity position like far outside the modern tradition and yet is using the, uh, the idiom of the modern tradition, like engaging that mythos to do other kinds of work, essentially like tapping into a shared aesthetic regime and a shared mythical regime. Uh, and it seems like you know, that's where the energy is. That's where the conference of value lies, like design new myths, stop asking people what they think that you're never going to find a viable measure of value like inside the, the mind. Yeah, for that, um, I, I, you know, Stuart, I kept thinking about like, um, you know, we had a conversation yesterday about circulation systems, like, uh, like I'm really interested in, dissemination systems of information, whether it's like a cookbook distribution system as a, as a, as a means in an industry to circulate ideas that would, um, like, you know, subversive ideas that you would not expect within that particular, like, distribution system, or like YouTube, you know, and I just wanted to bring up, like, you know, two references that for me have been really helpful in this, in this thinking. The first is Lucy Lepard's essay on Trojan horses and activist art, which um, looks at um, a number of artists um, that have basically like relinquished the idea of capital A art that sits on a plinth that you know performs within these very like within the cultural capital of like art economies you know within exhibition spaces etc in, in kind of normative ways um, because for them the the real impetus or the intention behind the work is cultural democracy right which then requires that you shed a lot of that baggage. Um, so I found that essay really helpful, and also Seth Price's essay in the early 2000s on dispersion, which looks at this kind of burgeoning image economy in the early 2000s, like, you know, this is like pre-Pinterest, this is like just when Tumblr was, you know, starting to take over, um, or this like curatorial impulse, quote unquote curatorial, I, I don't think it's curatorial, but basically picking things that you like and putting them in groups on a, on a website. Um, and. Uh, but like, you know, how do you intervene in that system and also in the way that that in some ways, quote unquote, in the Walter Benjamin, Benjaminian way, degrades a kind of work of arts like, uh, you know, that kind of singularity or iconic status, um, and, but democratizes it at the same time. Um, and so in that sense, like, I don't, I, I just didn't interpret, for example, so I don't, I, so, so okay, and yeah, a third reference. I, I tend to think about these questions around participation in these kinds of economies through a kind of Adornian lens of the imminent critic. Like I do, I do agree with you that I think it's a totally privileged position to imagine that you're outside of the vectors of like earning a living or having to do like a bathroom renovation or, you know, in my case, like photographing something for a for a magazine, right? Um, uh, but within those systems and knowing how those systems operate, like whether it's an algorithm, like on a very popular website uh, or whatever it might be, you know, like, or retail conventions, like figuring out that margin 
in which you can make that slight shift, which may not be capital R radical in the way that we've defined radicality as a negational practice from the 60s onwards, right? I just don't think critical practice can be used or evaluated on the same metrics of what we assumed critical practice was in the late 60s. I just don't, I, I, I find that regressive personally, right? And I think the project of the contemporary, if we're gonna bring it back to this conference, is to rethink what that looks like. Like, like that's the question on the table, right? And I think part of it is also accepting responsibility that we are accountable to the conventions as problematic as they may be of our like world systems and our disciplines. And then how do you literally like intervene in that system? And in that sense, I think, you know, Chantel, just to bring it to your back to your presentation and around history writing, you know, I don't know how you feel about new historicism, but I've also found that to be a model where I found that useful in terms of thinking about a model of like rewriting history from the margins, right? Whether it's a recuperative project of finding that figure that has not been, in a sense, like given his historical voice because they've like literally that history has not been written or providing a counter narrative to maybe that canonical voice um, that has been heralded for reasons that we have never been questioned or should be questioned you know what I mean um, and I think in, in all of those ways it's like all of these systems that we operate in whether it's like like you know universities are businesses you know we're not outside of like transactional econ economic flows you know and history writing curating an exhibition, there's all, all kinds of creative capital and social capital embedded within all of these activities that we do, intellectual capital, you know, all of that, right? That um, I guess like, you know, I understand your impulse of like wanting to feel like there is some resistance, but I do think all of us have one foot, like that's the question, like how do you keep one foot in that system? Because we are in that system, these many systems, and one foot out of it, right? And, and I guess the question is like, and in that way, it's like that question of like that measure of change is so like, how do you how do you quantify that? You know, and so maybe the question is like, how do you maybe that's the question on the table. Sorry, I keep I'm like not doing a very good job of articulating myself, but I feel like but um, like finding new vocabularies as I'm clearly struggling to um, to figure out how to describe that change, um, different metrics of change. Right? Or just different questions on the table. Um, and maybe it is like transforming a retail space into a space of public assembly to ask critical questions. Like I remember like I was invited to give a talk on a volume of architectural theory that I had edited in a space promoted by like um, BMW Mini. And I just couldn't wrap my head around and it's a bit like that report that I showed. Like, and like I recounted that history of like the you know the weird kind of back end of like who sponsored that because clearly their intention for generating a certain kind of report as people who are like clearly responsible for the conditions that are you know being studied, um, their intentions are, are might, might be one thing. And then as a cultural practitioner, like can you find a space of maneuvering within that? to produce a different kind of result, right? Even though it may still be kind of co-opted by that hegemonic system, right? Like, do, do you know, sorry, I'm just repeating myself. I'm gonna stop now, but that, that sort of, yeah. Here. Sorry, I, I'm hearing you, Esther, and I wonder uh, if there is a way in which, like, uh, what I, I was trying to say about uh, engaging with those kind of uh, larger um, constituencies that intersect with uh, the built environment uh, does not necessarily mean being kind of reformist or accepting that we are part of it. Like, I wonder if one could be oppositional, like uh, abolitionists, or like the, the most radical postures. Uh, uh, that that precisely to be oppositional, not necessarily just reformists, uh, in the way that I, I understand you, one does have to precisely uh, engage those constituencies. So, like, I, I I agree with you in what you are saying that the the kind of way the kind of uh, a way in which critical 
cultural practices that find their way of negating this, uh, like the market, uh, uh, traditionally is not an effective one. But I don't want to equate that with just being like, a, oh, but we are part of the system, so we can just do small reforms. I think one can uh, be more radically oppositional. Uh, uh, that, or, or that precisely to be radically oppositional in some matters, one has to think about the way in which architecture engages, call it uh, maybe audiences, it's not but like, uh, yeah, different constituencies in different capacities as audiences, as uh, users, as uh, uh, founders, uh, like uh, in, in different ways. But yeah, it, it's just a small point, but like when I was hearing you, I sense like a, a kind of timidity in the kind of politics that we can engage because we are having a conversation uh, in an institution like uh, that sure like we got paid to be here like uh, I, I don't think that that uh, makes that our, like the, the politics uh, need to be more timid and merely reformist uh, yeah, no, I, thank you for that. I, it's, I'm, for, I'm not I'm not suggesting the politics diminish in scale, but I'm saying that the the um, maybe the opticality of like or well, I mean, you know, for example, like um, like I've been running a social practice project, right? People fund that project. Uh, foundations will fund that project. I'll have grants, et cetera, funding that project. They want metrics on efficacy, right? Um, that efficacy is not optical, right? I, I can't, is that, you want to know how many people got, like, how many more BIPOC folks got into PhD programs out of it, or how many, how many jobs you got? I mean, it's like not, if efficacy in that sense is not an optical, measurable, quantifiable thing, it's qualitative, right? And it and it and I I have absolutely no way of understanding. Like again, I'm in, in as a contemporary project. I'm in the contours of the moment. Like I can't I can't assess that. So that's what I was trying to say. It's like that the scale of of measurement. Like we we don't we can't maybe we can't as contemporary practitioners ever know that. Maybe we do need to then pull that historical move and wait 40 years and then be able to have reconvene in 40 years and say like, you know that retail space that I designed back in like 2015 or whatever, like this is the thing that happened, right? Like I don't, I don't know. Um, so maybe in some sense like, um, you know, another thing that I kind of noticed with everyone is that there is a kind of like, whether it's teaching and like figuring out how to interact with students in a way that can like reach students in terms of their interests or, um, whether it's like, you know, retooling a platform like YouTube, um, you know, in a project around democratizing audiences for architecture, that it's always an iterative approach. And I think maybe that's also it, is that we're no longer like, maybe like singular artifacts of production don't make sense. Like it, it has to in some ways be iterative in order to test out the, through feedback mechanisms of like, what is what is quote unquote working or whatever your intention might be? Is working? Thank you. 
common denominator that everybody can comfortably live with, it can never be radical. But consensus is complex, it defines singularity, and can be radical. So again, you might argue that there's agreement in both, but they're dramatically different. I really like what you Nature just said about uh, radicality, which when you, uh, Esther, were talking, asking Chantel about, I think it's a new, new historicism, I actually first understood the new historicism. <laughs> no, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it was just that the, the revolution and the capacity to be disrupted through um, cumulative smaller means or the capacity to completely dismantle something. And I think both need to be available uh, for us as tools, as forms of uh, to operate. Then, um, Esther, also when you were um, uh, uh, presenting the MIT project, the predictive model, there was this moment that I felt for the need that, I, I felt that you were going to give us an answer of how to get out of the doomsday scenario. And again, this, um, in a sense, again, I felt for the need for simplicity, the comfort of simplicity. Um, So, um, uh, so okay, this idea of the simple answer, I find going back now to the pedagogical space that sometimes students don't know what's right. And that this need for an answer, I don't know if you find yourselves in the pedagogical space when teaching, that sometimes students want to know what's right. And I sympathize with that. Some days we want to know what's right. And often we, um, I find myself not alone, but with colleagues trying to find methods to feel uh, comfortable with uncertainty. And that is a creative, that's a powerful creative engine. And um, so then I was thinking, would I feel content leaving this conference without um, any more knowledge of what is or what is not than I came with two days ago, but trying, like I just say, to come up with answers that eventually might help us advance in that question, I think I would. Uh, so I learned tons of things from everybody at the table, but I might not be able to directly answer more intelligently what is or what is not contemporary. And uh, so, which brings me um, to a, a conversation that I think has been pervasive everywhere, and in that sense, Thomas, I really appreciate the option of the gradient. Uh, but uh, like a very real anxiety around the uncertain, uncertainty of things like climate change and uh, the incredibly stressful um, sort of social tension that exists definitely in this country but probably in other uh, places. So now to contradict myself in terms of trying to move away to the binary but also the need to construct systems to start understanding things, uh, this uh, again dichotomy between uh, wanting and needing to find answers and offer them to others as, again, a means to produce knowledge and uncertainty as a state of being that is equally productive uh, but somehow functions in a different way. I never let this time by committee anything, but I'm very interested in mechanisms for producing some type of consensus and perhaps uh, trying to figure out how to feel comfortable with that complexity. So I'm hearing everybody talk and there's like agreement and disagreement, but in a sense like a baseline of exchange that um, I'm finding incredibly productive, but it doesn't mean that we have more answers. Does this make sense? No. Okay, that's half my notes, but the other half. <laughs> students and we have a group here so maybe they want to like 
comments or questions, or maybe they know what's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the structure of uh, scientific revolutions, that uh, paradigms uh, do not progress as a linear accumulation. And uh, we need radical change to save the waters of uh, pre-existing worlds. And also about the other talks from yesterday, from Andrew Holder, that uh, we need to maybe a radical shift from an individual. Or Mariana Ibanez that said that uh, the technological uh, adaption curve, that uh, at first a small percentage can adapt to the changes, and this small percentage may be like uh, the pioneers of extreme ideas. And also about Stuart Hicks that he had to change his title in order to uh, build a narrative to address his issues. So how do we address you know, in contemporary issues and uh, do we need an audience or this uh, idea of uh, the public opinion does not exist i mean this is also like an outdated top-down approach i don't know i'm just addressing some issues yeah. i'm also in the I'd encourage the leverage points. I, is that working? I would encourage you to read the essay leverage points because I think, um, you know, in 15 minutes I could not go into the details of it. Um, you can get it for free. Um, Janelle, uh, you have had all over actually online. Um, what I found interesting though is I actually came to learn about Danella Meadows to the Sunrise Movement. Sunrise Movement um, are, were very explicit in their. Um, resources of how as like student activists essentially like young activists climate activists mobilized like incredible changes um in shifting shifting that middle ground of like uh you know approaches and also in terms of thinking about legislation um and um they basically use that as a kind of guidebook for how to self-organize um you know as a kind of uh you know an activist movement um, it's proof, like it's proof that it works in a way. Um, and yeah, it is a different model of change than, than other, um, you know, uh, historians or sociologists or practitioners of science might. But I think, I think that's what, for me, has attracted, like as someone that has written a lot about evolutionary biology, for example, that has a certain kind of like uh, narrative of progression and how transformation operates, it offers like a very different way that it imbues such agency on the part of um, you know cultural producers of, of people in the world, just like being in the world and how we you know you can um, start to think analytically about the systems in which you operate. Um, and, and again, like there's proof that it works on a kind of massive scale. So um, so I would yeah I think that's sort of my response to it is that yeah it is it is different. It's a different way of thinking about paradigms and how paradigms shift, but also the scale of a system, you know, you know, it's not like it doesn't have to be planetary, you know, it could be like your school, right? It could be your classroom, it could be a social, just any kind of social formation, you know. They always say that like culture what happens when you have like three people in the room, right? You know what I mean? So um, so I, I yeah, that's sort of what I would say to that, is that you know, I, I, I wanted to use it as a way to um, just as like a, a way to think through with empowerment of the way that theory can operate, and also maybe the way that like architectural work or architectural thinking can also operate. That, that idea 
really resonate when I came uh, to the school um, as a candidate. I talked about discrete revolutions, mentioning something very similar to what you're saying about change starting in a group of three people in a classroom, in a conversation, in a conference, in a way. And again, without uh, concrete answers, for sure. I would be really suspicious if we would have ended up these two days with a written definition about the contemporary. I think that change is slow, uh, it's interesting, it works through air movements and capillarities and leaks, and, and for sure it needs consensus. I don't think um, it's less radical because of that, but we are too many, really. I, I, I like to define things very simply sometimes, and I think we are too many. So uh, we need to understand how to address things and how to, to change things. And I want to say something that might be radical in this discussion, is that I love being a part of the audience, and I love being public. Uh, and I think those things um, are only bad when they turn us numb or, or, or not active. And, and I think that the algorithm sometimes presents me with new music because they, it knows the things that I like, so I get into getting to know other things. Um, so I'm a curious person, I love that. I, I kind of, um, some projects that are really successful as a park, as a, museum or something like that because I think that's public luxury in a way and that's something that we all share. So there are certain things that we can measure and that I kind of agree with but we need as educators and that's something that I um, kind of that in different ways are in disagreement I think we agree but in a public university as, as educators we need to help build kind of a very active attention. So media generally makes us numb and we can be procrastinating in many things so many times. But we learn how to, we can learn how, how to choose. There is choice. And that's, I, th that, that's, I think, maybe uh, something that I want to share with the students particularly in that sense. We can select what to read, what to listen, what to participate in. So I don't know if there are other comments, Thomas? that note maybe also play into the um, uh, the role of lists. Um, one, one list that Carrie and I always go back to often is, uh, is official advice is how to work better. Uh, point five is distinguish sense from nonsense. And I think uh, one thing uh, uh, that um, we are constantly at odds with within the contemporary is the amount of noise. There is, I mean, Esther uh, kind of clearly made that visible to describe uh, and the simultaneity of historical surfaces. Um, I still, to this day, can't explain um, what a topological surface is to a student, and I love geometry. Um, uh, but but the, the one example that really spoke to me, like within this context of how to kind of make sense from nonsense, is um, the very kind of quiet and uh, unspoken uh, means through which Charles Fleming like made impact. Um, Sounds like it was kind of ingrained in him that you know reticence was actually quite radical, um, or could be radical. Maybe not as his father framed it, but maybe as he would um, when he would try and operate within the systems that were you know feasible. Um, Love the idea that well, if you can't use glass, then let's kind of build an architecture out of masonry. Um, and I think uh, it's it's important. I think moving forward for students to kind of be be discerning um, and to act with conviction and and specificity, um, whether it's um, uh, looking closely at uh, kind of an overlooked uh, figure, um, or uh, um, I think uh, trying to again make sense of, of the uh, the nonsense that is uh, the internet uh, through through metrics or kind of whatever kind of uh, available metrics there are to try and demystify um, the algorithm, uh, and and I think starting from there um, will also help us as architects um, establish some sense of like what are our kind of disciplinary values um, to. Uh, Try and again, every once in a while, uh, you know, try and uh, determine um, yeah, what what is consensus for for that moment.
I can't say thank you without the microphone. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much for participating and being here and for the generosity of the ideas and the commitment to the conversation. That's relevant. Thank you.